Welcome to this episode of STR News Live. I'm Andy McCaskey, and in this uh, series, we talk about all sorts of things relating to the world of information technology. And uh, today, we're happy to welcome back uh, once again uh, Mr. Tim Crawford, who has uh, joined us uh, before. Tim, uh, welcome. You've been a busy guy here for the past couple months. It has been a busy, uh, busy several months. Uh, this year has definitely kicked off with a bang. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that I uh, wanted to chat with you about was uh, uh, a blog post that you had recently talking about the data tsunami. Uh, an interesting turn of phrase, and uh, you've got a lot of data to back, to back that up and to talk about that, don't you? I do. Um, there's, there are a lot of different aspects that we could talk about with regards to data and, and what I'm referring to as the impending uh, data tsunami. But the important thing here is that this is something that's going to affect everyone. It's not going to be relegated to a small subset of enterprises or folks. And that's a, that could be a harsh reality for a lot of folks to kind of wrap their arms around. Well, I think you talked about really three major elements, uh, that, that there's a large amount of data that uh, in, the, in the near term, say in the 12 to 18 month time frame, certainly over a three or four year time frame that are going to impact companies, uh, maybe in ways that uh, they don't quite uh, understand. Right. So the, the first wave, uh, if, if we use the same anal uh, analogy, the first wave that people are going to be fighting with, and, and they're already having to deal with this today, is just the sheer volume of data. It's massive. Um, based on a recent IDC report, uh, they projected that by the year 2020, the total amount of data across the globe will equate to some 40 trillion gigabytes. Now, that's just a massive amount of data, but if you bring it down to an individual, uh, level, that's roughly 5,200 gigabytes for every man, woman, and child, which is a lot of data. And then if you extrapolate that times 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 person company, it's a lot of data to, to contend with, to deal with. And we've got to figure out ways and methods to be able to uh, accommodate that. Well, there, there's certainly a lot of publicity surrounding the Internet of Things and you you know, once everything has an IP address and is squawking its status from time to time, but there are sections of, of uh, technology right now that just uh, generate incredible um, uh, volumes of data, and this was a, a part of uh, your post there. Right, yeah, I use the airline industry as one example, and there's been a fair amount of press around uh, what GE is doing to really understand their their wind farms and their uh, airline engines. And um, there have been some other studies that have been done as well. But, for example, um, every Boeing 737 engine generates 10 terabytes, terabytes with a T, of data every 30 minutes of flight. So if you start extrapolating that out and start looking at some of the newer engines, you're looking at roughly 240 terabytes of data for each cross-country flight by the time you extrapolate the number of engines and the rest. That's a lot of data to be able to parse through. And I did some math to take that a little further to try and understand, well, if we looked across um, the entire global 787 fleet, the Boeing 787, which is the Dreamliner, uh, as most people refer to it, if we look at the amount of data that the entire fleet generates, that's some 40 petabytes every single day, which is a lot of data. Now, that's across multiple airlines. But if you drill down into one airline, so for example, I use Southwest Airlines, if you look at one airline and start to understand the amount of data they have to contend with generated off their fleet of 607, 737 aircraft, they're having to contend with 256 petabytes a day. 256 petabytes with a P a day, which is just a phenomenal amount of data to contend with. Well, now you've developed uh, a kind of a maturity uh, index or levels of maturity that a CIO has to be able to exhibit to deal with these uh, sorts of volumes. Right, yeah. The, 
the three fundamental stages. The first stage is just kind of getting your arms around everything together. So when you're talking about the sheer amount of data, how do I get my arms around it and be able to manage it and address it? And some of the classical uh, data warehouse or classical storage methodologies just won't work for that. So we need newer methodologies to be able to accommodate that. And some of those exist today and others are being developed. The second tier of it has to do with the correlation of data. So going back to the airline example, how do we start to take performance data off of engines and that turn that into data around customer experience and satisfaction and being able to correlate those different components of data together and pull them together. So and then the third think- level or third tier has to do with having the data speak to us. So what is the data telling us? Meaning we don't have to ask a question of the data, but the data actually pre- prescribes a certain activity or certain decision to be made. And those are three fundamental tiers or th- fundamental processes that we're going to have to go through as we start thinking about data in each enterprise. So the, the ability to derive business value out of this is in, in, recogni- in detecting the correlation and then figuring out what action needs to be taken given that correlation. Is that correct? Right. In the, in the second tier, the first thing you've got to do is figure out what pieces of data touch different components of data and then be able to make some sense of that. And that will help you in your decision-making process, either in terms of increasing accuracy, uh, increasing efficiency, lowering failure rates. Uh, there are a number of different metrics, metrics and reasons why you would do that. But then the next tier is actually taking that, that step uh, a little bit further in such, that, such a way that you're creating rule sets around activities and types of data sets. So it's not just the correlation of the data, but it's actually where the data prescribes a certain action on its own right. Well, in addition to these three general challenges that you have, there's some other implications that weren't uh, maybe quite as obvious. Yeah, the the uh, first one is that when you start thinking about pulling the different components of data together, um, you you end up with different data types, and not all data types are equal. And so the the challenge is you want to be careful not to create what's being discussed as the data landfill, where you just pull all the data together because you're not sure which pieces you'll need or not need today or down the road. And so it's going to be important to understand which components to keep, which components to get rid of, and kind of thinking ahead a little bit. Um, and then the, the other piece is that some of these data streams are not going to come from within your organization. They could be coming from social media, such as Twitter or Facebook, um, and you've got to parse across uh, those data streams as well. So you look at Twitter, 400 million tweets per day or Facebook with 4.75 billion content items per day. That's a lot of data to kind of sift through and figure out which pieces are usable and applicable and correlate to other activities that are coming in from within the enterprise. What, what element or how important are privacy considerations going to be in, in, this, uh, in, in this scenario? They're going to be huge because as you start putting together these different components, and we could talk about retail players. In the retail space, one of the things that's, that's really advantageous, as with most enterprises, is to create profiles of your customers and to really start to understand your customers, to be able to personalize data and personalize offers and solutions and products directly to them. The problem is, as you start pulling together some of this data, you're going to start putting together a, a pretty healthy profile that's very specific to an individual. And there's, amount, there's a certain amount of trust that comes with that from the consumer side, but we want to be careful that we don't consider every piece of data as pristine, every piece of data as needing the privacy requirements. We want to make sure that we understand which pieces need what types of protection based on a number of different factors that could include local, state, federal, um, regional privacy laws, but it also may be just good business to protect certain types of data. Whereas other types of data, 
doesn't need the same level of protection or privacy. And we want to be careful that we're not throwing the blanket over all data because that will um, potentially hinder innovation. I think one of the things we talked about uh, a little bit earlier with respect to the sheer volume of data coming in and uh, making sure that you have, have good data, that uh, it's not contaminated uh, uh, from a signal to noise uh, standpoint. But that's a technical challenge that you know has yet to be addressed. But uh, also, it looks like there are implications as far as the skill sets that are involved, which then you're, how do you attract and retain uh, people that have those uh, skill sets? Yeah, the, both, both issues are real issues. So separating the signal to noise in terms of good data versus and valuable data versus um, non-important or unimportant data is, is a challenge today, quite frankly, but it's going to be increasingly more challenging just because the sheer amount of data that's coming in, you need a way to automate that. You need a way to quickly ascertain what data elements kind of sit in that pile of um, this is really valuable for me and what elements um, sit in a pile that is less valuable and then maybe a third pile which is not relevant. And so that might be a, a component that, that gets excluded. The second piece uh, in regards to talent around understanding how to manage data, understanding some of these new methodologies, we're going to have to evolve our teams. The way we lead organizations, the way we train, the way we educate folks, uh, the way we architect applications is going to need to evolve. And from two different aspects. One is in terms of just retaining the talent we have and being able to move the company forward or move the business forward. But then the second piece is as we start to attract new talent, they're not going to want to work with older technologies and these older methodologies. They're going to want to work with some of these newer methodologies. And so part of the part of the process of moving us along within a company, within an organization, is both to retain internal knowledge and move the company forward, but then also to make sure that we're relevant for um, hiring in, too. Well, Tim, as always, it's uh, fascinating to talk with you about, about some of these topics. Um, of course, you, you can, uh, people who are watching can, can read the entire blog post at avoa.com. Uh, also, they might be able to catch you at uh, some of the shows coming up this uh, spring. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your schedule. Yeah, I've got a pretty healthy schedule on the road every week, uh, at least for the next two months, and that's just what I know about today. Uh, I try and track all of my events and activities on the blog at avoa.com slash events. Um, upcoming next week, I'm at IBM Pulse in Las Vegas, and in a couple weeks at the HMG CIO Summit in Palo Alto. Um, and then after that, the beginning of April at Interop again in Las Vegas. Well, Tim, I uh, wish you uh, good travels, and we'll be keeping up with you, of course, uh, on Twitter. Uh, what, what's your Twitter ID again? Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at T Crawford, T C R A W F O R D. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks very much for joining us here today. Safe travels, and we look forward to our next time to talk with you here on SDR News Live.